Hello everyone from the Novage team. Welcome to today's webinar, Creating Details in Vectorworks. In this session, we will learn the best ways to create details and incorporate them into a drawing set with Vectorworks. We will learn the four Ds of detailing and we will look at the five physics principles of detailing. Are you curious yet? Hang on tight because our presenter, uh, Jonathan Pickup, uh, will walk you right through it. Uh, Jonathan is an architect trained in New Zealand and in the UK. He has uh, more than 30 years of experience and he has been writing and producing Vectorworks manuals uh, for more than 15 years. His company, Archon CAD, is the premier provider of third-party manuals and training resources for Vectorworks. So don't forget to check it out, Archon CAD. And Jonathan also runs the Vectorworks online user group and provides its main direction. And now let me tell you a little bit about Noveg. Noveg is one of the largest online stores for design software. And we have a huge assortment of software solutions uh, for really every designer's needs. You can find us at noveg.com and come take a look at the uh, Vectorworks uh, product page where we have all the Vectorworks uh, product line. And for more daily software news, you can find us on Facebook, Google Plus, Twitter, and even Instagram now. Coming up next week, the Array Next for 3ds Max. And uh, I want to remind everybody that I'm recording this session. So if you want to rewatch it, you can do so on Vimeo and YouTube. And now I will share um, Jonathan's screen in a second. And he will take it from here. Take it away, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. So I've just brought up on my screen here the handout that I gave you, which is all about creating and managing details. So it's not the entire um, post that I write for my monthly user group people, but it's just a small, uh, a small set of it, a small selection. So we're going to look at some of these um, really important things. For example, the four Ds of detailing. The, um, if we want to keep order out of our buildings, there are four main techniques. I call them the four Ds. It's, it's not just me, but other people call them that as well. And the first most important is this principle of deflection. That is deflecting water away from the building, preventing the water from entering the building. So we could be talking about something like a roof overhang to deflect the water away from the face of the building. We might also be talking about something like a drip or, or an edge of the building where the cladding material make sure that the water is deflected away from the foundations. Or it might be something like a flashing, which is a classic piece of um, technology that helps the water that gets into the building to get to the outside. Water damage where I live has been an absolutely crucial issue. Uh, leaky building syndrome, they call it. I think it's been a problem in Canada. And so I've, I've been teaching architectural graduates or architectural technology students and this is uh, one of the sort of main things we go through. Now, if you can't deflect the water away, you need to be able to drain the water away. So let's assume that water will get into our building. We need to create chances for the water to get away. So where I live, we use things like drained cavities. Um, brick is a classic one where you've got two skins of brick with a drainage cavity in between. We might use a rain screen system, which assumes that water gets through and we drain it out the bottom. Window, quite often, if you look at the details of windows and window technology, you'll find that they assume that window that water will get into the frame in some way, and there are drains to let that water out. I mentioned brick cladding. Brick cladding where I live has always had this step in the, in the concrete slab, because we've always assumed that bricks are leaky, and we always know that water's going to get in there, and we have to have an open part to that brick to let that out. Uh, the, usually it's one of these verticals called a perpend, and usually we have a series of those that are open, and they will let the water drain out, plus they will let that cavity ventilate. Now in some cases, you can't create <coughs> deflection, and you can't drain it, and you rely on something called drying. That is, you know that something's going to get wet, and eventually the sun is going to come out, and it will eventually dry that product. Good but it's the third 
if we look at these in terms of hierarchy, deflection first, drainage second, drying is the third. And the last one that you should be relying on to keep your building safe is durability. Because there are some things where you just can't make dry. You can't deflect the water away from, for example, timber foundations. And where I live, we create a lot of timber foundations. So we've got things like floor joists, bearers, uh, piles or posts. These things need to be treated so that they are durable because we can't keep them safe any other way. Now there are also five physics principles that we have to worry about when we're creating details. So water ingress due to gravity, the water runs down the face of the building, where does it go? Well, it goes to the lowest point. And if you don't put a flashing into this detail here, the water's gonna drip and, and pond around our, our window detail, and that's gonna cause trouble. It can cause rot, it can cause mold, all sorts of things. So the simple solution, put in a, a flashing to deflect the water. We've also got the problem of pressure differential. So when the wind blows or there's atmospheric pressure, you have a different pressure uh, inside than outside. And if it's a high pressure outside and low pressure inside, water can actually creep up your flashings and get into the building. Solution is to provide an air seal. So you need to provide a rod backing to protect the back of the seal. And then you can seal that up with some sort of um, plasticky, silicony type air seal. Kinetic energy, this is a great one where I live. The wind is quite strong where I live and it blows the wind or the wind blows the water up the slope of the roof. If you do not put a stop end on the um, end of your roofing material, typically where I live it's, it's metal, so it's easy enough just to bend that metal and, and put a stop end. The water will blow up and into your building, causing damage, rot, mold, all the rest of it. I know, I know a case where someone didn't take my advice and put the stop end on it. And when I went to see them again later, I said to them, what's those damp patches up on the roof? He didn't want to talk about it. Um, so that's the solution to put a stop end. A surface tension is another one of our problems. So surface tension is where the water sticks to things. So I was looking at a detail the other day with um, someone wanted to put a a downpipe, but they didn't want to see a, a downspout, I think kind of they, you call it. They didn't want to see the, the pipe actually go down because it was a glass window. And I suggested, what about a chain downpipe where you actually have a chain that goes down, the water sticks to the chain due to surface tension. Great in that example, but terrible in this example here where the water can stick to your cladding and it can then run along the underside of your suffetes and it can enter your buildings. This is a really bad example, um, or it's a, it's a good example of a bad problem. The solution, and this is really old school, is to have a drip edge. And this is where the water has to drip off the end because it can't climb uphill. When I lived in England, I noticed that, that even old buildings with big stone windowsills had a drip edge cut into the bottom of them to stop the water going across to the building. We've got the problem of capillary action. I don't know if anyone uh, is aware of this. I hope you're all aware of this. But capillary action is where you've got a narrow gap less than a quarter of an inch. And the water can pull itself up small gaps. And the, it's actually quite easy to resolve. It's quite easy to fix. The solution is really just to have some gaps. So here we could have a problem with our um, siding where the water could actually creep up between the two gaps. The water can creep through these gaps in our timber windows. And the solution is to have these little gaps in it so that when the water gets to that point, the, the gap is too great for the capillary action to carry on and the water just stops. Again, these are really old school techniques. So this is the handout I've created. Um, Water ingress caused by gravity, here's your solutions. Capillary action, here are your solutions. Surface tension, and kinetic energy, pressure differential. And that's the, um, the handout that I've prepared for you. So I've actually got my website on my other screen so that I can make sure I'm uh, covering everything. And I'm just gonna scroll through to make sure that I don't forget anything. So the, 
Barbara, I'm surprised there are no questions about any of that. Not yet. So we're, yep. so we're going to start looking at how do we get details into our Vectorworks. So one of the ways of getting our details in is to import something like this. This is a, a DWG detail, and we also have PDF details. So I'm going to go back to Vectorworks now. So where I live, we've got a, a building code that tells us how we should be keeping our water out, and it also has what's known as a, an acceptable solution to prove that the water is going to stay out of our building. So that acceptable solution is a building code, and I've got my building code, so I need to see my navigation pane. And it's one of my uh, building codes, and it's called E2 AS1. And I'm going to drag and drop that. Let's just have a look at it before we drag it in. So this is my building code, and down at page 80 something, we've got a whole lot of roof details. Let's just have a look here. There's all my roof details. How should we keep the roof protected? And here we've got on page 82, a bunch of barge board details. So that's on, uh, it's actually on page 88, just here. So I'm going to import that document. Let's get rid of that because we don't need it. So there it is there. Let's drag and drop that PDF file into my Vectorworks. It was page 88. Now I could reference that document if I was worried about it being updated, but in this case I'm not going to. So let's import that, and I've now got my PDF file. Now my first trick is, it looks fantastic, let's make that into a viewport, and I can make that into a detail, but, oh, is it to scale? So let's check. So I know this piece of timber here should be about uh, three and a half inches or 90 millimeters, so I'm going to turn on my snap to geometry, otherwise I can't snap to it. Select my PDF. It's really important you select your PDF because then I'm going to go scale objects. Now if I scale the objects, the current distance is 62, the new distance should be 90. Just if I click OK, there's an option here for scaling the entire drawing. Huh, why don't we just do that? <clears throat> of course. Well, entire drawing sounds like it's just going to do all the stuff that I can see. But entire drawing would also scale every resource that's in my current file. So all of my timber symbols would be scaled. All of my text sizes would be scaled. All of my hatches, all of my gradients, all my drawing area would be scaled. Everything everywhere would get scaled. So let's go scale objects again, and let's not scale the entire drawing. We'll just do that PDF. If you forget to select your PDF when you do that, modify scale objects, you'll notice that entire drawing is ticked, but grayed out, so I can't even turn it off. Now this will scale everything in my drawing. If you scale everything in your drawing, it, will, it won't destroy your project, but everything in your project will now be wrong. So please be careful with that one. Now that I've got that, I could make that into a viewport. So let's go to here. I'm just going to check my viewport. I've got my roof details already drawn. So I'm going to delete my viewports. So I've got a, a layer for that. Let's go back to my design layer two. So I want to make a viewport. So I'm going to use a rectangle because it's just a, a nice, easy way to create a detail. And now I'm going to scale, uh, turn that into a viewport. So view on the menu bar, create viewport. So this is my barge detail. Barge detail, it's going to go on my roofing details and barge detail. What scale do we want? 1 to 5, maybe 1 to 10. It's going on the correct roof layer. Top plan is correct. Okay. So there is my detail at 1 to 10 on my piece of paper. Now, if I've got the scale wrong, I can easily change that to 1 to 5. And so there it is. 
Now you might notice that I've got some information here that I may not want, this thing here, refer table to seven, and this bit here, so let's see if we can't fix that. Edit annotations, I'll move my detail label up. I won't back this up anymore. Now I should really change my crop area to remove this bit. But, and I could go right click and I could go edit crop and I could use tools to edit that area. But actually there's a quick way. If I just select that viewport and I select my clip tool, some people call it the eraser tool. But if I just select that and I click to start and I just highlight the area I want to remove, I'm just gonna hold my back quote key to stop it snapping. It just takes that little bit away. Take that little bit away. And actually, I don't wanna see that either. So let's do that as well. Corrugate a profile, let's just remove that. And so it works just like an eraser. And what it's actually done is to change my crop outline. You can see there, that's the shape of my crop. It's just a very, very quick way of changing your crops. So if your crop is too large, I quite often do that and just take a bit away so I can shorten it up a bit. It's just, for me, it's just quicker than going into the crop area and making those changes. So that's my first detail, my first barge detail. Now I want to create another one. So back to my design layer. And this time I'd like to import a DXF file. So I should have a DXF file. Let's have a look at my notes. Now I could drag and drop this into a into my job. My advice to you though is don't. Always, always import your DXF files into a blank file the first time so you can check them. So let's try that again. So I'm gonna grab my shadow clad external corner. We'll pull that in. And what settings do I want to use? Now normally you start out with the default settings. Here's the page scale. Do we want 2D and 3D? For this detail, everything's 2D. I know they've used millimeters, so I'm gonna choose millimeters. I want this to be one to five. I want graphic attributes to all colors, black and white, classes. Uh, and I'm gonna add, um, <coughs> later on I'm gonna input James Hardy details. So I'm gonna call this, uh, this is steel and tube, I think. So I'm gonna put ST in front of all of my classes that Vectorworks imports. Uh, any objects that were there? If there were any objects at all that were uh, dimensions, I would tick that and convert them to groups because then I can see what size things should really have been. And then okay. So okay, it's done its job. Now if we go back to the PDF, one of the things that people said to me when I did this was, that's great, Jonathan, but I don't like the font they've used. I want to use my company font. Or I don't like the curvy arrows. I want them to be square. Well, I'm afraid it's a PDF. You're stuck with whatever you've got. In this case, you can see that I could uh, actually change this. This is a raw text. So if I had a text style, I could just change that to my text style. So that could be quite handy because you've imported that. It's now raw information so you can now go through it and you can adjust this information. Make sure you've checked the size of these things to make sure they're about the right size. So that's come out at 85 millimeters. It should really be 90, but 85 will be fine for my purposes. But it's got everything there. It's got all the information I want, it's got titles. So that's not a bad way of doing it. Now I did say to you that you should do that into a blank document the first time to check it, when you've tidied it all up, you could copy that and put it as part of your library. I'd like to try importing another way because on the, in the same folder, let me just show you what I've got. In the same folder, I've got all the details that deal with siding, uh, linear, James Hardy, linear weatherboards they're called. I'm not sure what they're called overseas. They, James Hardy I know is available in America. Um, but I've downloaded all the details that I want. They're all inside this folder. Now I could just drag and drop that folder in, but I'd like to go through some of the options you've got. File, import, import single DWG DXF. So I could use that option. 
but I actually want to choose this one here, importing a whole bunch. Now there's something I meant to um, something I meant to go over. When I imported the DXF file into this one with drag and drop, I went through all of my settings. Let me just go back over those again. So I went through all of my settings, but the one thing I forgot to tell you about was that you can save those settings. So once you've gone through all those settings and you've gone, yes, I want to use that, I want to use that, I want to use that, you can save that and call it steel and tube. That's the company that makes that. I know what what's that was uh Styline, wasn't it? So that's CHH. That's the company, Carter Holt Harvey, that's the company that makes my shadow clad. So I now know that whenever I import information from that manufacturer, I can use that graphic style. So let's go back to this file, import, import, DXF. <clears throat> so now when I'm importing files, and I might want to import, um, and here you can see I've already chosen it. Let's go back, choose folder, creating details, linear weatherboards, let's select that folder. So it's selected the entire folder. So it, it's actually selected all of the files that are inside that folder. It knows how many there are. It's gonna look through it. It's gonna find which ones are DXF files. So it's gonna leave the other ones behind. And you might notice that you can click on set custom options here, which will bring up the dialog box where you can go through all those choices all over again. Or you can pick up one that you've previously saved. So I've done this before. So I know that this James Hardy system works. I know what scale everything is. <clears throat> and we could just import that. Now, if I choose to import the current file, import all these into the current file, it will go through and import every DXF file and it will store it in this current file as a separate thing. Let's just have a look, we'll try that. Now you might notice over here that we've got the design layer blinking and it should be creating a new design layer for each detail. It will also duplicate all the symbols that are inside these details and it should also be creating, I probably can't change it, but um, it should be creating a series of classes as well. So what I've ended up with is a whole series of classes and a whole series of layers and each layer represents a different detail. So let's have a new blank file. Okay, and let's do that again. So file, import, import DXF DWG. So we're gonna do the same thing, only this time, we're gonna import them as symbols in the current file. Now previously, they were just raw information, they weren't symbols, they weren't groups, they were just a bunch of things, and if you, you'd, you'd have to go to each individual layer to find those objects. Now this time I've chosen to make these into symbols and you can actually see a preview of each symbol arriving on my page prior to it being made into a symbol. Now the difference is going to be that because they're symbols, I'll see these details on my resource manager and I'll then be able to use my resource manager to import them into another project. So let's make sure. So it looks at the moment as if I've created absolutely nothing or nothing has been created in my file. If I go to my resource manager and have a look, this is untitled four. There's a folder here called DXFDWG. And here are all of my details that have now all been imported as a detail. So if I wanted to, I could go back to my other project here. And I could say, all right, well, I need to create some, some linear weatherboard details, I need a, a window detail, so I can just drag and drop that in, and don't show this dialog. So there's one of my details. I need another one, uh, let's see, do we need that one? Yes, we need that one, let's drag and drop that one in. So I could then drag and drop all of those details into my project, and then I can make a viewport from those. So that's a jam cavity without facings, that's the one I want. So I can now go ahead and make that into a viewport, View, create viewport. That's my window jam. Uh, we can make a new sheet layer for that. 
021 window details. And it's at one to five and okay. <clears throat> so there's my detail, my window jam on my piece of paper, ready for printing. But that, so what I've ended up with, so Untitled 4, if you have a look, has ended up being a library of all of my details. If I make my resource manager larger and make my preview larger, you'll find it easier to see the detail that you're selecting. So that's a way of starting off your entire library, which is quite handy to have your library of, of objects. So I'm just gonna look at my notes because I'm, I'm just doing it from memory at the moment. Yep, so I've done DXF, imported DXF. Okay, so let's actually talk about how we, how we should actually draw a detail. So we've done importing PDFs, we've done importing uh, DWG files. So what's, the, what's my strategy for, for drawing details? So my strategy is normally to start with the structure. If we have a look up here, uh, I'm in detail, untitled four, so I can use this, I guess. Up here, I have a, or I should have a folder. I've got a bunch of bits and pieces in here. Let's have a look in here. There's a piece of timber I can use, but I've also got a library here where I've got all the timber objects that I've uh, used over the years, and I can reuse again. They have their line weights selected. They've got their classes correct. So if I double click on that, I can start by creating a detail. So that might be the start of my object. I might have another one here, and I might have another one there, and I might have another one there, and so on. So maybe that one shouldn't be a, a, a proper stud, maybe it should be blocking. And I think I've got a blocking symbol here. And so that's the start of my timber. I'm gonna use my polyline tool, polygon tool, and I'm gonna create the edge of my wall lining or the edge of my frame. And I'm gonna give that no fill. So then, so I've started with my, my structure. I'm gonna use my offset tool. I could calculate it, I guess. I'm slightly lazy for that. So I'm just gonna click and I'm going to go there. And that's created my other line. Now where I live, we also have building wrap on the outside. So I'm gonna put building wrap. I've got a distance of two millimeters. I click, that's my building wrap. And now I can create my line style for that. And I'm gonna choose a line style, which is that one. Now, because of my scale, it's one to one, that may not look the way I want it to print. So let's change that to one to five and we'll get a much better idea of what that's gonna look like in reality. So what do I need? I need a piece of, uh, a small piece of timber. I need a 45 by 19. Let's place one of those there. Now, before I go ahead and finish placing that, let's talk about how we want that to look because if I use my symbols well, I might want that piece of timber to just jump off a little bit. So let's just go to there. Maybe it would be nice if that was just jumping off my um, cladding or my building wrap by just a couple of millimeters. If I edit this, so let's right click and I'll choose edit 2D component. I could take that symbol and I could move that symbol. Now that's a, a little timber object I've created. I'm just gonna go move. And I'm gonna lift it up by just a small amount. I use two millimeters, which is one twelfth of an inch. So watch what happens this time. If I use that symbol again, notice my cursor is no longer at the bottom edge of my piece of timber. So I can click here and I can place that. So it automatically places at the right distance away so it's readable. I could uh, make that again, but it's already in the right place. Why don't I just mirror the thing? And if I mirror it from that corner to there, I'll get another one. And now what I need to do is to put up my uh, cladding and my internal lining. Now I think there's a tool that we can use for that, which is the detailing tool and it is the linear material tool. So I'm gonna start from here there, click there, make sure you line up with that bit, click, and then come down and double click to finish. So what kind of linear material do I want? Uh, it's just a generic board. It's only about uh, half an inch thick. 
maybe it's plywood or something. So 12 millimeters thick. And let's go OK and see what we get. So there we are. Now you, you might remember I said to you that I like to have that offset by a certain amount. You can use this offset here on your learning material. And now I've offset that object by a specific amount. Now let's try doing the internal. This one always, I always get confused with this one because sometimes it jumps on the wrong side. Let's do the offset 14 millimeters and it goes the wrong way. So we'll make that two millimeters and it's still going the wrong way. So what I'll do is I'll draw it the other way. I think this is where it has a mind of its own and I just make something else. You notice it's always jumping to the other side. So maybe in this case, it might be better to use something like my double line tool. Make that 12 millimeters here. It's a double polygon tool. What are my options? Don't create lines, just create polygons. And I can click to start. And this time I can actually choose the, the side that I'm working to. So once you've got that detail underway, you can start annotating it uh, and you can start working on that. So that was in my notes and quite often what I do is, uh, this has been so useful over the years, having a library of parts that I can use to create details. I've actually got a folder here called library parts, which has got all my little bits and pieces a little bit of a flashing, a capping, a cranked bolt, a little bit of uh, steel, um, a standard window. They're just so useful having these parts uh, uh, in my file. How are we getting on for time, Barbara? Still no questions? I, I, I'm, I'm staggered. Okay, so. <laughs> Still no questions, but good. That means everybody's understanding and following, following up. Yep. Okay, so let's talk about making a detail library. Because there, there are a couple of different ways of making a detail library. So one of the things I find quite often with my designs is that you, you can't always just take one detail from one building and apply it to another. You often have to look at um, how you get, um, you often have to look at at the, the, the design and how that works. Um, someone's asking, they were looking at how to integrate the details into a building model. I'll get to that towards the end. Um, I often use color in my details. Uh, you might notice, I think that I've got some red lines in there. Um, I'm not sure if I've used it in this particular file. Let's go and have a look. So one of the things, um, Phil, you were asking about was, do I use colors in my in my details? And actually I do quite often use colors. And if you have a look here, you'll see that I've colored my timber and I've colored my insulation. But I was also thinking, Phil, that maybe what we could do is when we draw detail, maybe we could actually start to use these classes here to control specific parts of my um, specific parts. So here we have concrete. So let me show you, if, uh, so we can use a polygon tool, we're gonna to draw a little concrete slab edge. So if I use that and I apply concrete to that, so it picks up the line weight and it picks up the fill type, and then I can get my piece of timber. I think we've got a piece of timber here. Let's put our piece of timber on there, and that should really be lifted up, so we need to move that up by four millimeters to allow room for my DPC, which might just be a line. And I'm just gonna draw in the middle there. And then I can just, so that's a line object there. And then I can say, all right, well, you're a DPC, just apply that. And so what you end up with, Phil, is instead of trying to think, what do I want to create everything? It just does it for me. So if I wanna create a rigid air barrier or RAB, I can just select that and then I can draw my rectangle and that should fill in the right color and it should fill in my RAB with the right line weight and all that kind of stuff. So setting these up could be really useful. If I wanna create a timber, if I want to make this, for example, uh, 1.2 timber, it goes pink, sorry, yeah, pink. And if I make it H3.2, it goes that greeny color because where I live, 
we have to have different colours or, or when they're actually on site, the timber is actually stained a different colour. So the, the building inspector knows whether you've got the right um, level of treatment on that. So I quite often use colours in there. So you can see here I've created a detail where I've got the rebar that's on the detail rebar class. I've got blocks that I've imported from my library. That is a detailed jib, and if I apply RAB to that, it changes its color. And if I make that insulation, it changes its color. And if I make it jib or Gibraltar board, drywall, it picks up the right graphic style. So I'm just using graphic styles to help make it really quick to draw my details. I don't have to rethink them. Those classes are stored in my layer and class standard, and I can reuse it again. Uh, DPC is a damp proof course protects the piece of timber from any rising damp coming up through the concrete. Uh, so where were we? Uh, DPC, we've answered that. Uh, oh, how do we save a, det a detail to a library? Okay, so there's a couple of different ways that we can save a detail to a library. So we could start off with a brand new file like this one, this untitled one, and we could then set up a, um, a layer Let's make this layer perhaps our, our untitled one. This is shadow clad. Let's make this design layer here and we'll make this our linear, linear weatherboards. So this will be all my linear details. Just make off sure I've got the right active layer scale, one to five. And let's start importing those. So don't forget that I've got Untitled 4 where I imported all of those details. And I could just choose the ones that I want and drag and drop them onto this layer. And this could then be, I could then save this file as my layer, or I'll save the entire file as my linear weatherboard detail layer. You can also, if you wanted to, grab details from this imported file and you could drag and drop them into, if you had something here, for example, you might have a detail parts folder here. You can see I've already done this once before. So we might go to Untitled 4. We'll find the details that we want. And we grab that detail, it's my window detail, drag that into my library, and Vectorx will then save that detail into that folder of my library. And now that will be available on every job, everywhere that I've used that, uh, everywhere that I've um, made this a favorite. Now I use two computers, I use a Mac and a PC, and I connect them together using Dropbox. Now what that means is that I've just updated my Arconcad library, both on my PC here and on my uh, Macintosh, which is at the other end of my office. So just using that as a way of, of keeping your library going. So that might be one way to do it. So let's go back to this file here. Now let's say, for example, I've worked on a project and I have a lot of details that I might want. Because you know, quite often as an architect, you actually end up with an entire layer with all the details that you like. So I could go, let's create a new design layer because I need to create a design layer for all my details. I'm going to import a design layer and I'm going to choose a project that I've used recently. I just, I'm just going to find it. It's on my other screen. I need to find my current project and find the location of it. And make sure I get the latest up to date file. Okay, so let's open. So, what I've done is I've gone and I've found a file that I've worked on recently. I need all my one to five and one to 10 details. So I've actually got two layers. I create one to five details on one to five layer and one to 10 details on one to 10 layer. I've got two layers. If I import layer objects, what, we'll end, what I'll end up with is Vectorx will actually go to that file, find all the things that are on all those layers and import them into this project. And that's another way of creating your detail library. You start up with a couple of layers and you put all the details you want in your library on those layers. And when you import them, you can then access all of those layers. 
So there are all the details from that project that we were just looking at. So we zoom in and there's a, uh, this is a rib raft or a, um, I think you might call it a waffle slab. So that's the construction of a waffle slab. If I turn on my zoom line weight, you can see a little bit easier. I've got different colors to represent different line weights. So that's insulation, that's my rib, that's my, there's my notification to say that my library's just been updated. Um, and so you can see someone said, do I use colors? Yeah, I use a lot of colors on my detail so I know what line weights we're looking for. Someone asked, why would I not use a wall type for a detail? Sorry, James, I'm not quite understanding um, how the wall type would give me all of the level of detail that I want. Are you thinking about it in plan view, are you, James? Instead of drawing the, the lines and putting all the bits in, you could just draw the wall type with the separation. You, you might be able to do that. Um, but of course, my details, uh, you're still going to have to put the, the timber studs in. You're still going to have to make sure that you've separated and you've got a blank space between lines. So you could perhaps do that. And, the, and an external corner detail usually doesn't look like uh, a simple wall. Uh, let me see if I can find one. So there's a, there's a detail, James, for you. And you can see I've actually shown where the drywall connects together. I've shown the I've shown the actual joints, which one which one lines over which. Also, this is a rigid air barrier, and you can see there, James, that I've also shown which one lines over which. I've also got my cladding, and I also need to make sure these are separated by a specific amount. So sometimes you could draw a wall, but there's there's actually no difference. You might even instead of using a wall type, why not have it use the double line the double line polygon tool? and have some components like this where you can actually have some sort of components to separate things. But once you've drawn a detail like this one, James, surely what you want to do is you want to use that on job after job. And I've just shown you how you can leave them not as a symbol, but import the entire layer. So that's the entire layer brought through and you can see it's brought through all of my details. Now they're not neatly drawn, they're sort of scattered all over the place. I don't know if that matters very much because I can just make viewports from those and then start to assign them. So back to design layer one. So when we look at, uh, this will be the last thing we do, I think, before we start um, assigning our details to our projects. Um, someone said, isn't it, isn't it ideal to import them as symbols so you never have to mess with scale? Well, it depends on the scale of the text. So if you import them and you put them on a, uh, if you import them as a symbol and you put them on a one to one scale, what size are they gonna be? If you import them at one to 10 scale, or put them on a one to 10 scale layout, what size is the text gonna be? Um, I don't know if there's a if there's a proper answer. I don't know if um, someone else wants to join in here, Francois, I don't know if you wanna join in and say that there isn't one ma major way of doing it. Maybe there are other alternative ways of doing it. Um, details can be quite useful uh, as symbols, so you, they're easy to import. Um, but what the, the challenge that I've got with some of my symbols is that sometimes I want this particular symbol to be metal cladding, sometimes I want it to be linear weatherboard cladding, sometimes I want it to be shadow clad, uh, which is a um, another material, and maybe a way around all of that is to use classes, so it's the same symbol, and I can turn off my uh, trim line, and I can turn on my, my direct fix shadow clad, or I can turn on my cavity, or I can turn on my linear weatherboards. So maybe that's another way around the problem where you could actually make them into symbols, store them in your library. Um, the, I guess one of the reasons I've gone away from using symbols is the symbols always needed editing in some way. And so you'd always end up having to do some editing. So the last thing we want to cover, we've got time for it, have we, Barbara, is how do we now start to put these details into a project? So what I'd like to do is, uh, I'm not sure if I've got any drawings, let's just have a look. We've got roof details, 
I should really, I really need a roof plan. So I'm going to create a quick building. So design layer one, let's create a new design layer. And I'll just draw a quick building and create a quick roof. So a new one, this is going to be walls. Okay, let's do our layer scale. And one to 50. So I need a quick building. So I'm going to draw my walls using the rectangular mode to make it quick. And I would just, we'll just go straight to a roof, I think. So let's select all my walls. And I'm using the landmark workspace for some reason, architectural. And let's create roof. So it's a vertical edge. There's my thickness, there's my bearing height, and okay. And I need to make that one a gable end. So let's make that into a viewport. <coughs> so I'll put a rectangle around it. View, create viewport. And this is going to be my roof plan. And it's gonna go into a new sheet layer. And there's my roof plan. So now I'm going to edit my annotations. So right click, edit annotations. And what I really want to do is to create a reference. So I'm going to my Dims and Notes tool set. I'm going to use this reference here, the section elevation marker. Click and double click to finish. So that's my section elevation marker. We want to have nothing at that end. We want to have no text at that end. We want to change the font of that maybe or the formatting of that. So text, format text. So I want that to be 10 point, aerial narrow. And so that's a detail. I'm going to change the line weight of that, make it a heavy line. And that's my barge detail. So I'd like that one to reference the barge detail that I've already created my other viewport. Just to refresh your memory, we have a sheet here, uh, which is roof details, and it has a detail on it, which is detail number two, called a barge detail. And that really should be detail number one. Back to my roof plan. Right click and we'll edit the annotations. So here I'd like to link that marker to the other viewport. So there's a button here, link to viewport. If I link that to my number one barge detail, barge detail, you'll notice it picked up the number, number one on sheet 20, which was really cool because that's actually picked up the number that I wanted. So let's, create a section. So back to my design layer, where to go? Design layer two. Oh, walls are there. So back to my walls, let's have a look at this in 3D. We'll select, uh, we'll select the entire building maybe, and we'll turn on our clip cube. So show clip cube. So when I activate my clip cube, I get a clip cube around the entire building. I'm going to use this to cut through my building. There it is there. And then I'm going to right click and create a section viewport. So now I'm going to create a section viewport for this, put on a new sheet layer. So that's my section. It's, it's in a perspective. I didn't want a perspective. So we'll change the projection to orthogonal and let's update that. So there's my viewport. We've got a barge detail that we want to reuse. So let's edit our annotations and we'll go in and we'll use another tool, which is this one here called the detail callout marker. So my barge detail, it's going to be rounded rectangle mode, 
around there and we want that to link to my same detail and let's format the text on that i should really have a text style for this 10 point so that's pretty cool i've got a, a, a roof detail shown on oh look, look at my label okay let's fix that so we've got a roof detail shown on our section and we've got it shown on our plan and we could do that on our elevation too if we wanted and now what i'd like to do is go back to this roof detail and actually i want to put another detail before this one so let's renumber that number two i'll zoom in so you can see so i renumbered that number two let's just have a look at my roof plan that's updated now that's still number two and let's have a look at my section that's updated as well that's number two so these are linked together so if you start doing this technique then what you'll find is that you can put all your details on your sheet layers you can then put all your detail references you can link them all together and if you have to move them around they will all update so if i go back to roof details and i move that particular detail from roof details to window details let's have a look at my roof plan again it's updated it's updated its number so I've got a couple of comments I'd like to have a look through. So Francois is saying to me that um, I agree that symbols for entire details are problematic as they need to be changed. I use symbols for parts of details, flashing profiles, dimensional lumber. Uh, one option would be to create a red name symbol for entire details that become editable once placed. So if we just have a look at that, right click. Uh, it's, let's import that into our current job. Okay. Let's look at our current job, this one here. So what does uh, Francois mean by red details? It means that when you right click on this and you choose edit symbol options, you choose this option here to convert to a group perhaps. I think that'll make it a blue one. Uh, you can also choose what class that's going on so it, it doesn't accidentally switch off and you don't want to see it. So when I go back to this one and I import that particular detail into my drawing, details one to five, and we'll make it top plan view. So when I import this detail, it is no longer a symbol, it is a group. And as a group, I can make as many edits to this as I want and it doesn't change any other symbol. So that can be quite a handy technique. Um, when you're using the colors on details, are you printing them with or without the colors? Um, I often print them as a PDF file and then email them to the council. Uh, we are now, where I live now, we now have electronic submission of building consent drawings only. So it actually doesn't matter whether I use color or not. I'm not paying for any extra printing until it gets to the um, contractor. And let me just have a look through. Uh, when coming from a 3D model, do you have all of this in the model or do you add the 2D symbols in the viewports? I tend to add the 2D symbols in the viewports where I need to, um, unless it's quick to add the 3D model. So for example, if I'm doing roof construction or floor construction, it's actually very easy to use tools like Create Joists, uh, architectural, Create Joists. This command will create all of your floor joists. So since you can create all of your floor joists easily, why not put those as part of the symbol? Slabs can be, uh, you can very quickly make slabs in 3D. So why not just make them in 3D? That way when you cut a section through your model, you've already got that, that information. Um, I've been looking at ways of creating my slab thickening on the edges. Um, and I've got some ideas. Uh, and Francois, if you want to talk about those separately uh, outside this, let's do that because I've got some ideas that, that uh, I think could make it quicker. I just haven't got time to cover those here. Um, and Barbara, I think that's probably our time's up, isn't it? Just, yes. Yeah. I've just got uh, two minutes for me to, to pro, you know, do my self promotion. Don't forget that I've got my website with my courses on it. Uh, these courses are fantastic for for learning Vectorworks. If you're new to Vectorworks or if you want to update, 
If you're familiar with Vectorworks, the subscription website here, we get together every month. People are finding this extremely useful to get together. Um, I've got architect group, I've got a 3D modeling group. We just talk about the problems that have come up this month for those people. Uh, and it works really well. So people are really responding well to these, Barbara. It's better than the best book club. Yeah, right? it's a lot of fun. I mean, it shouldn't be a lot of fun, really, should it, Barbara? But it is a lot of fun to get together and, and chat about your problems and, and find solutions. Right, and I hope you will reach out to Jonathan Zark on CAD and join the user group because um, everybody that I know that it's, has joined is, uh, has no regrets and is very happy about it. So um, join the club. And uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. I'm taking um, the screen back. I, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. And I want to remind you uh, to also check us out, novage.com, for all the Vectorworks products. And with the new release uh, uh, pending upon us, you can give us a call and find out about great promotions that unfortunately we can make public, but we can only tell you in person. So reach out, call us, and uh, ask for Calvin, our Vectorworks expert. And he'll uh, catch you up uh, with all the new promotions. And uh, coming up next week, we have a webinar on V-Ray for 3ds Max, if that's what you use for rendering. And um, if you miss something, the recording of today's uh, broadcast, it's going to be posted on Vimeo and YouTube. Just search for Novedge. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And uh, have a wonderful day, everybody. And until Thanks the next webinar, me, yes, thank you. Have, have a great start of your day. I know it's very early, so, um, and enjoy the rest of your, of your day, everybody else. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.